and somehow we've managed to get to the last episode covering 1996. The next will be first for 1997 and the compilation video will be out soon. For now though, let's see what games I've prepared for us for today. Not to be confused with Walt Disney's Jungle Book, a platformer from 1994, this Jungle Book is a first-person perspective FMV adventure game. And it's a very, very, very weird one at that. Why? Well, because the game comes with a microphone. Yeah, the game requires you to speak to it. But that's not all. Before you think, wow, it's a fun gimmick, it may actually make for interesting gameplay. Let me set you straight. While you do quote-unquote talk to the mic, you don't use your words really. No, that would not make you ridiculous enough playing the game. You talk to chimpanzee, in chimp language at that. Yep, uh-huh, so... Uh, you'll be sitting at your screen making various monkey-like noises and I like to imagine you also doing all the scratching and such, cause I would do that myself too. And if there's anyone sleeping at home when you play Jungle Book, they won't be sleeping for much longer. Starwise, King Louie, an orangutan that rules the monkey city, has his crown stolen from him. Now, how did the monkey living in the depths of the jungle got the name Louie, a predominantly human name, also a crown and became the king? I don't know. But facts are facts, it is what it is. And the crime needs to be solved. Especially that he's mad after losing his precious. Now, to restore the kingdom to its original idyllic state, Mowgli and his friends count on you to restore the stolen treasure and bring back peace to the jungle. Because as usual, you're the only one capable of doing so. Naturally, as in most adventure titles, you'll do it all by solving various adventuring puzzles, and in this particular case, also by watching short FMV sequences. They may not be overly long, but there's over 100 minutes worth of them, so Jungle Book should provide at least few hours of entertainment. All that said, it's more than clear from the get-go that Jungle Book is aimed at the preteens and younger audience. The puzzles are not too difficult, the game has no points of no return, and plays more like an interactive choose-your-own-adventure type of a book rather than your typical point-and-clicker. Is that bad though? Nope. And if you have any kids around, the simplicity of gameplay and decent in quality for the time footage may actually still keep them entertained even today. Oh, and the microphone feature is toggable, so if you turn it off, you'll get so-called monkey puzzles instead, which are variation on a classic arcade but not video games, and infinitely more fun than the monkey noise gimmick. Killing time is what I seem to be doing every single day when going to my day job. I mean, what am I doing there even? Am I waiting to get old? To die perhaps? We'll never know. But definitely, killing time. Killing Time also is a horror noir, non-linear first-person perspective shooter with some superficial adventuring elements intertwined within it. Story-wise, having recently recovered with the help of Dr. Hargrove, a mythical water clock of Toph, a wealthy Hayres Tess Conway throws a ginormous summer solstice party and attempts to use the artifact as a key point to the festives. As you can probably guess, things don't really go as planned. As if they did, we'd had no game to play. So mysteriously, everyone who attended the party disappears for decades. Many years later, a former student of Dr. Hargrove, which you'll be controlling, arrives on the island the party took place and must uncover the secrets of happenings on the faithful night. The island, however, seems to be overrun by a slew of various really unusual and often weird creatures. I mean, there are green clouds of questionable origin, perhaps ghosts of former farts, there's also a bunch of skeleton warriors there, you know, the staple of fantasy-themed games, two-headed hounds straight from hell, so hell hounds, if you will, Huge beetles, in fact, way too many huge beetles, nude mates with gargoyle wings, which for the sake of this channel I'll try to avoid showing at all cost, killer clowns, because mid-90s, and even zombie bootleggers. Yes, as in alcohol smuggling bootleggers. Like I said, they're the oddest bunch you've seen, and I've only named a few. And since the game world is relatively open, and you can pretty much from the get-go go wherever you'd like, killing time is extremely difficult. Because while you can explore anywhere, you really shouldn't. Some areas are just a bit too demanding initially. And by a bit, I mean a lot. Since over this non-standard FPS hangs veil of simple adventuring, you'll also be solving various puzzles too. All to uncover the story. So you'll be conversing with ghosts, seeking keys and shooting. Which is not a puzzle per se, but given how unusual the arsenal at your disposal is, and how weird the enemies are, I'd consider it one anyway. Having to figure out which odd weapon like Ankh, for instance, works best against which enemy. Killing Time's open world is its strongest and in the same time weakest feature. Cause while it allows you to experience the island freely, in any order you'd like, providing for a bit different adventure for every gamer, you will also do a lot of backtracking. And by a lot, I mean shit tons. You'll be visiting the same areas numerous times for various reasons, puzzle exploration and combat alike, which can get tiresome if you're hoping for a traditional FPS experience only. But if you like genuinely scary games with some decent shooting and a dark story to boot, 
killing time may be something for you to try out. Brace yourself, because I'm gonna try to do something I've not done before and go through this entire next game in a Russian or at least nondescript hard Eastern European accent. So let's check it out. Crazy Ivan is a first person sci fi mech based arcade shooter. I know, long sentence, but I couldn't have said it any other way. And trust me, it was as difficult for me to spit this string of words as it is for you to listen to them all. Sometime in the first half of the 21st century, so soon. Earth is attacked by the evil aliens, which is a mood statement really, cause it couldn't have really been attacked by good peaceful aliens, could it? Anyway, they've quickly overwhelmed our forces and erected energy generators in five crucial areas of the planet, taking hundreds if not thousands of prisoners. Those generators create a field of sorts and it's slowly encompassing the entire planet's surface. And what happens when it will, eventually, is something we'd rather not know. So someone has to stand up to the alien forces and save us all. Since most armies of the world were decimated, there's not many options left. Fortunately, one of them is Ivan Popovich, so-called Crazy Ivan, and he under your control obviously will repel the aliens come using his mech aptly named Steel Cossack. From the moment you run it, it is more than obvious that Crazy Ivan was not created with death or involving story in mind. It was made for pure, mindless shooting fun. And if you approach it, it's five huge areas like that, you won't be disappointed. But if you'll try to dig deeper, try looking for some meaning behind it all, or even worse, try comparing it to other games like same year Smack Warrior 2 Mercenaries, you'll be disappointed. Because despite the obvious similarities, Crave Ivan is not really trying to compete with anything. There are two generic groups of enemies that you'll tackle, smaller ones that tend to respawn and generally speaking are like ants to you, insignificant and easy to dispose of and bigger, deadlier, which are meat of the alien forces and more often than not are huge sentient mechs. To complete each stage you need to defeat all the bigger ones and then destroy the field generator. To complete this more than obvious objective you have quite a few weapons to choose from, from guns for projectile launchers to various missiles and special weapons of limited ammo, and more. Defeated enemies leave recharges and refills behind along with humans to be rescued, and in between the levels you can rearm, upgrade and replace the shield for your mech. Crazy Ivan is definitely not the game you'll be reminiscing playing for months if not years, but for a few odd hours here and there it can be quite fun. Oh, and he's crazy, and that's always fun. Max Mechanized Assault and Exploration is a real-time strategy, mainly, but not only, and I've never played it, cause I'm not big on RTSs. So, everything that will be said about it here is based on my research and not experiences. Max takes place on various planets that you and your opponents try to take over, by exploration of the land, exploitation of the resources, expanding of your sphere of influence and extermination of your enemies. Despite what it sounds like, it's not an X4 game however, whatever. While I initially said that it's an RTS, Max can also be played in turns, which should open its gameplay up to many more gamers, especially those like myself who do not like real-time strategies. And while there's quite a few options to pick and choose from for the turn-based mode, customizing it to your desires and skill level, Max, I always felt, was made with real-time in mind and turn-based mode was just added on top of it. I may be wrong though. The game can be played in either campaign, tutorial or custom missions mode and if you went through the whole campaign, then it's that last mode that will keep you entertained for hours, as it offers near limitless replayability. Especially that there's 8 entirely different factions to choose from, each with their own strong and weak points and specializations, more than 50 land, sea and air units and unusually for the genre, all of them can be upgraded with better armor, speed and range. And finally there are also numerous buildings to erect and take advantage of, making for a very customizable and unique experience. Like I said, I've never played Max, cause whenever I saw it it was run in real time and thought of turn based mode in it made me feel that it was added on as an afterthought on top of already working mechanics. Perhaps it was a mistake and perhaps I should give it a chance. But the more I think of it, the more it feels that it would just end up being RTS but played in turns meaning the same mechanics but with pose. So, unless one of you convinces me otherwise, I'll leave this one for the history books and not reapproach ever again. Master of Dimensions is an amazing name for the new potential human spin-off, but also, and more importantly, an Israeli sci-fi point-and-click adventure game that overlays sprite graphics on top of pre-rendered 3D backgrounds. Worth noting, as it's not a given for the genre, and when done usually ending being an odd, often out of place looking experience. Same here, sadly. It is based on an RPG system of the same name created by the developers of the game years prior to its release, and focusing on travel to fantastic parallel dimensions and universes, often in different periods of time. 
So the game's story initially, in its background, depicts an ancient conflict between Merlin and the Wizard of the North. Conflict that Merlin sadly lost, and the evil wizard destroyed his staff, breaking it into five pieces and scattering across different dimensions to ensure that Merlin would never regain his powers. You play as a young dude who accidentally found the dimension travel machine and will use it to recover all five pieces of the Merlin staff, return him to power and save the world. Most likely in this particular order and all in one sweep adventure. While most of the game world and its dimensions are available to visit from the moment you start playing, there is only one correct way of going through and completing the game. So, make sure not to get lost in the freedom that it offers. Pick up everything that's not nailed down, as countless items will be required in resolving many of the puzzles, and some of them even need to be combined first before they could be used. So the more you have, the higher the chances you won't skip something crucial. Especially that it's not always obvious what and where to do next, so having the option to use trial and error may save your save more than once. Sounds stupid when said aloud, I know, but ultimately it makes sense. Not all puzzles are inventory based and some may require figuring out a solution to a particular problem, usually within a time limit, or even traversing successfully through convoluted maze. So make sure to save often as the difficulty of this is all over the place and you can never tell how demanding or easy the next one will be. The dimensions that we'll visit are all unique and differently themed. From dark noir, through Egyptian, vampire, all the way to futuristic space station and anything in between. So, if variety is what you're after, you'll definitely find it in this game. Other than that, Master of Dimensions is a rather standard point and clicker. It's not especially good, but not bad either. It's just there, somewhere in the middle of hundreds of other titles, quietly rotting away from existence. So unless you've nothing else to play, I doubt that you will ever go out of your way to complete this one. Meridian 59 is one mistake away from being a legend. If it was called Meridian 69, not only it would be better remembered today, but we'd also have much more fun playing it back then. But cringe jokes aside, Meridian 59 is one of the very first 3D MMORPGs. Presentation-wise, Meridian didn't look great when it released, and it definitely doesn't look any better now either. But its engine's simplicity can be most likely attributed to the internet speed constraints of the time it released in, as most people were still using dial-up connections of questionable speed and stability. So the processing power that would be spent on presentation went into sending, receiving and uncompressing amounts of data sent over the phone lines. Same reason why sounds and music design was that limited too. Pleasant, but limited. As in other MMOs, first person or not, Meridian is all about creating your player and then having him go on thousands of adventures, often of a repeatable nature, getting better, stronger and more powerful and having fun with others. All because majority of characters that you'll meet in the game are other people. All that said, Meridian 59 is not a game for an odd hour or two every few days or a week even. To be able to fully enjoy it, appreciate its huge world, lore quests and adventures, it requires a considerable commitment. In terms of both. Time and effort. In this, it doesn't differ that much from MMOs of today. With one notable difference, that is. It requires no monthly payment and has no microtransactions. Other than the initial purchase, that is. Which sadly is something virtually unheard of today. Meridian 59's time of glory is long gone, years ago in fact, and while it can still be played today, in huge part thanks to a Steam re-release, I question the scope of its player base today. Is it big enough to warrant a return to this classic? Is it feature-rich and feels comfortable enough to satisfy a modern user? Well, honestly, I don't think I'll be checking. I have plenty on my plate already, hardly any time for myself, and adding an MMORPG, even an older one to all that, is just not something I'm prepared for. But if you're someone who can invest some time every day in an ongoing adventure that's one of a kind, or at least was like it in its heyday, then it may be worth for them to give Meridian 59 at least a passing look. Necrodom is a little like Twisted Metal, but with less engaging story and worse gameplay. In essence, it's a first-person futuristic driving arcade shooter. Note that I did not use the word racer, because it's not about racing at all in Necrodom. It's more capture the flag type of a deal here. So, you're driving around over 30 different arenas in heavily armed and armored vehicle, annihilating anyone else that you meet. Well, you can technically always try to find the flag that's usually in a locked off area somewhere and then get it back to your starting position. But it's not as fun as killing everyone else's. Oh, and dear YouTube deities, please hear me out. I meant killing in an in-game meaning only and have nothing else in mind. Forgive me, please and thank you. Your enemies will consist of eight different types of other vehicles and flying and foot soldiers. All obviously should be disposed of, preferably in style. Because knowing you, you even do your killings in style. It can be done with your car, or alternatively, you can step out of it and run around on foot. 
which may make some of these hard to reach for a vehicle areas more accessible, but you're also in open and less resistant to any incoming damage. Necrodome is not bad, but it's also a bit tedious, as all you really do in each of the boring as flat and semi looking arenas is chase down the switches that open locked off areas, search for hidden flags and fight against various enemies. And don't get me wrong, all that is fun in a limited degree, but it's not fun enough to warrant games longer stay, as it's not especially varied or entertaining. So, if you're into mindless shooters every once in a while, Necrodome may be perfect. But if you look for something deeper, look somewhere else. Space Hulk Vengeance of the Blood Angels is a first-person tactical horror themed shooter. Not as in monsters, vampires, werewolves and such horror, but as in aliens the overwhelming feeling of loneliness and death creeping from behind every corner kind of a horror. I hope you get what I mean. It is based on Warhammer 40k universe and it's a follow-up to 1993's first Space Hulk. And for the most part, it actually plays very similar too, but looks much, much better and features less loadings. Well, I played the first on the Amiga, so perhaps it did not load too much on PC either. I have no way of telling you. Vengeance is as difficult and nerve-wracking as the predecessor, so fans of original will love this one too. Or hate it, because it's one of those games that you love only because you hate it. It depicts the struggle of Terminators of the Blood Angels chapter of Space Marines against the Tyranid Gene Stealers. The game is a mixture of tactical planning and first-person shooting, so while you can control even up to 10 Terminators, issuing them orders on a tactical screen, when you jump into any of them to assume control, you are moving and fighting in 3D environments, not unlike the ones you would find in any other FPS. Albeit in a maze of only 90 degrees turning corridors similar to those in earlier dungeon crawling RPGs. The simplified map, however, does not take away from the atmosphere of dread-inducing dark corridors that you'll be traversing through, emanating vibes of some kind of ancient space gothic churches, temples and castles. Seriously, the design of the environments is one of the kind here. Most prominent in those larger open areas though, where high ceilings can be 2, 3, even 4 floors up which coincidentally are also areas where it's the easiest for your team to die. Because in Space Hulk, this or earlier for that matter too, you have to have eyes all around your head. As while your weapons are rather strong, they only are on a distance. In close combat, when you're unexpectedly attacked from behind, it's surprisingly easy to die. So Space Hulk is a game where each, even the smallest and seemingly most insignificant error may be a difference between life and death. Keep that in mind. Oh, and while all that seems like a lot and seriously complicated title, Keep in mind that unlike the first game, you get to control other marines in the second after completing few easier missions first, so that it gives you plenty enough time to get used to everything that it has to offer. And sadly, that's the game's worst point too, that by the time you get to issue those orders, you pretty much saw most of the content in the game. And while the future missions will be more demanding, the scary stuff scarier, hardly anything new will surprise you gameplay-wise. Probably because it was based on the board game. So, if that's an issue for you, avoid Vengeance, it's not a game you'll enjoy. If not, then better have a pair of spare trousers just in case within the arms reach, as the ones you're wearing may not be enough of the third, fourth or fifth time Gene Stalkers surprise you jumping from seemingly nowhere and attacking from behind. I love Star Trek. I love everything that it stands for. The near utopian Earth, the urge for discovery and learning new things about the universe, other races and various kinds of phenomena, the peace-striving attitude and solution-focused approach to problems big and small, rather than the one that we often employ in our real world, so searching for those responsible and not solutions, which is the worst kind of problem solving that there is. But I digress. Star Trek as a whole, in my eyes, is a gem of creativity and a goal that we as a species should aim for, to become humans, earthlings and not smaller nations constantly involved in conflict and wars as we are now. So, naturally, whenever there's a new Star Trek game, I have to try it out. For instance, two days ago I completed Star Trek Resurgence, a few months only old game perhaps and chock full of little technical annoyances too, but interesting and involving story nonetheless. So I've played most of Star Trek games is what I'm saying here. But I've never played Star Trek Borg. In fact, I've never even heard of it until a couple months ago when I've made a list of Windows games to cover for 1996. So, naturally, while I pride myself on loving the universe, all I will tell you about it will be based on my research and not experiences. That said, I may revisit the preview in the future video, as I will be definitely getting my bony human pose on this one, when slash if I get a chance.
Star Trek Borg is a first-person perspective FMV point-and-click adventure. You play as a young Starfleet cadet whose father died in the historical battle against the Borg at Wolf 359. Naturally, a traumatizing event for a child and a good starting off point for a Starfleet career. Now, as a grown-up, you're a witness to Spark that's the beginning of another potential deadly Borg conflict. Starfleet, however, given your emotional trauma, refuses your involvement. Enter Q. Masterfully replayed by John Delancey himself, Q gives you the opportunity to do one better than help in this current conflict. He offers you a chance to travel back in time to the Battle of Wolf 359 and save your father. And since Q is omnipowerful, it's not empty words, it's a real opportunity. Star Trek Borg is a first-person perspective type of a game, so you're basically taking part in an interactive movie as it plays out. Initially as a cadet on the bridge of your father's ship, and as you play, you will be making a lot of important, often irreversible decisions and solving some intimate puzzles. In time, you'll be transferred into bridge security officer's body to potentially change seemingly inevitable outcome of the battle. Interestingly enough, the game allows you to pause the footage at any given point, pull out your tricorder and inspect everything that's on the screen. And when you do, Q provides the narration describing objects and characters that you scan. It's a fun concept that all fans of the Star Trek universe will no doubt appreciate. Many of the FMV games are terrible, and I'm aware that this one has the potential to be one of them too, but I'm full of hope that it's not and will definitely be trying to play it on my own to experience in full what it has to offer. And as such, I cannot give you a recommendation or suggest skipping it, as I'm not really even remotely familiar with it yet. Total Mayhem aka Total Mania is a bit disappointing isometric action shooter. Not disappointing because it's bad, it just aims to do so much and not really delivers. Overcomplicating the gameplay in the process. The plot is kinda spot on with what we're worrying about now in real world, so AI, well not me but some are, a Terminator adjacent scenario to be precise. So, in the year 2140, the human race has been enslaved by the machines. Originally built to wage our wars, the machines outgrew us in strength, intelligence, everything and took over. Like I said, a very Terminator-like future. As years have passed and we're kept locked off barely surviving, some begin to mount a resistance, begin to fight back, recreating cyborgs using the very same technology that enslaved us, crafting warriors for our freedom. You are leading a small group of set cyborgs in a campaign composed of numerous missions, each with their own objective. If you ever played any of the Crusader games, you'll feel right at home in Total Mayhem. It's also an isometric action shooter, also features tons of enemies and destructible environments, the latter to a certain degree and has some very simple environmental puzzling, focusing mainly on finding hidden entrances, keys for locked off doors and areas, and the likes. As you go through the game, you'll gain access to better and stronger weaponry, but naturally in response to that, your enemies will become more challenging too, and you're giving a control of up to six cyborgs at once. Now, while it's fun and all, switching between them in the easier, earlier missions, in time it will become troublesome, as those cyborgs that you don't actively control at any given moment just stand there like silly potatoes waiting to be shot by the enemy forces, having no AI to them at all. So the further you get in the game, the more chaotic the missions will be and more often you'll need to switch between your units, which, while a novel concept, gets tiresome real fast, and the game would benefit from a singular protagonist like in Crusader much more. All that said, if you enjoy action shooters and don't mind moments of panic-inducing switching between many cyborgs trying to save them all at the same time, Total Mayhem is actually pretty fun and may provide an hour or two here and there of explosive fun. I wasn't fully aware of it getting into the year initially, but 1996 was truly incredible for Windows. Not only DirectX was in full swing, but Dev started releasing excellent, original and ported titles and even ultimate versions of previously DOS-only releases. It was a year of progress, it was a year of games, it was a year of fun. What do you think of the games that we've went through so far though? Do you think any of the later years will be able to give 1996 run for its money? Let me know in the comments below. Oh, and so I won't forget, the compilation video rolling all separate episodes covering the year into one should be out very soon. If you like the video, hit those like and subscribe buttons below. Smash them if you have to, it helps more than you could ever know. Also, I would like to thank you and all my amazing Patreon and YouTube members for helping this channel keep going. And last but definitely not least, I would like to thank all the wonderful folks who record and upload playthroughs, let's plays and other retrocentric videos here on YouTube, because they help to preserve the games that would have otherwise belong forgotten. So thank you.